So, this is hopefully what you've, uh, you've uh, achieved. Now, this is how I got the, uh, uh, the uh, if you want to get an ANOVA-like table, we can use LMR test as well. So, if you remember that before we had the AIC and things like that, but if you wanted to look slightly prettier, with like uh, uh, this type of output, we can use LMR test and we can write R ANOVA to do this for, uh, for this thing. And then we'll print the null model and it will print the uh, AIC values and whether it's a significant effect or not. Okay. So I didn't run you through all the checks which you could do in terms of checking your model. Uh, but we can uh, check this via some packages and most of the time you might want to check it visually. So what we are doing here is we're trying to see if the residuals from our model, so the trash bag, so if we build a very good model, there should be no patterns in our trash bag. It should behave quite nicely, it should be normally distributed and all that. So what we do is we use a package here called uh, Dharma and we simulate the residuals for our, uh, our model. So we take our fitted uh, model and if you want to wait longer, you can uh, get a thousand. In this case, we just simulated 20, 250 residuals. And then we can plot them. So we can sort of plot and see, like expect observed. And you can see this is quite nice. So they fall right on the, uh, on the, on the axis, so there isn't much deviation. So if your model was really off, it would start varying like this, or it would start varying away, or like do this really weird shape around the line. And this is also the predicted values and the residuals. So this is what our model predicts, and this is the trash. And hopefully we do, wouldn't find much patterns in there, so that across, doesn't matter if we're predicting in the middle or at the end, we're getting the same type of error. That's what we do in a perfect model. So, and here we sort of see that it behaves quite nicely again in terms of like, if we move across the predicted values, the residuals sort of stay the same and they're sort of scattered, yeah. So we're making the same type of error at high scores of norm exam and at low scores of norm exam, which is sort of what we want from our model, yeah. So these are just some visual checks and you could do all the regression type of checks that we talked about before, but these are just uh, uh, some, we can also, if you wanted to get like a formal test, it will do this kolmer smirnov test to see if this line is actually normally distributed for your uh, residuals. But just uh, what uh, what they call the interocular trauma test, like a result so obvious that it hits you between the eyes, shows us that this lies quite nicely on the line. So you don't need any test statistics. So whenever you can rely on the interocular trauma test, so just see it's so obvious that this is a good model. Yeah. So for the homogeneity, we can sort of, uh, uh, again, do something. We can plot our, uh, if we just type plot, we can, uh, we'll plot our model. And we can so, sort of see that there's no real funnel going on. You remember that this was what we were looking for in regression. If we have a funnel going one way or the other way, it means that we're systematically over or underestimating the error as we go along our uh, x, uh, x value, yeah? So homogeneity is sort of okay in the sense that I don't see a real pattern here where it's funneling in one way or the other. Yeah. So some tips for uh, for your uh, for your uh, adventures in multi-level modeling. So if you're interested, sometimes you're interested in a cross-level interaction. So you're interested, for example, whether the percentage of boys at the school influence boys' performance. Yeah. So that's an interactive effect where you have something at the individual level and something at the school uh, level. And for those type of things, usually you would want to center your var uh, variables first. So you would take, for that proportion of boys, you would take the grand mean of uh, across all the schools. Yeah? So typically what is advised is that you center your variables. There's different ways to do centering. You need to be sensible about it and you can read some more about it. But usually you want to uh, not compare like zero, like absolutely no boys, to, uh, to like one, all boys. So that's why we also use centering to make our coefficients more interpretable. Statistical power, depending on the effect you're looking at, the sample sizes you will need will vary, as I've told you as well. And But remember that we have really large data sets here, and multi-level models tend to be quite data hungry. Yeah, In order to estimate things properly, especially if you build more complex models, it is going to be quite data hungry. So you can, uh, if you really need to calculate power, you can simulate power based on this and this website. 
and that will allow you to estimate like how many cases you need to have at every level in order to have enough power to find an effect. So uh, you've heard me bang on past about effect size measures, like is something a large or a small effect, not just p-values. This is going to be very difficult sometimes to obtain for these multi-level models. So because, again, we don't know if you're caring about this top level or the bottom level or about the interaction between both of them. So what I've done in the past, for example, is you can z-score everything and then it's interpretable as an effect size. So if we, use, if we shift one uh, standard deviation in this, how much do we shift in something else? Yeah, But even there, it's assumptions on how you calculate those depth scores. You calculate them for each group or across all the groups. So you, that depends how you interpret your z-scores. Yeah. So that's one way. If you want a quick and dirty effect size measure, you could just z-score everything as you do in regression. And then they're like betas, and that's a measure of effect size. You sort of know if I shift. Uh, so a beta of 1 is a shift of a full standard deviation in the uh, dependent variable. Yeah. Uh, and you can have a look at uh, uh, some monstrosity, which is called the interclass correlation coefficient, and some other things there if you really need to have those effect size measures for your write up. Now, we can build more levels. So, uh, not, uh, not evaluated here, so I'm not going to go into too much details, but I'm just going to show you how you can build more complexity. So, you will have to uh, do that in your, uh, in your assignment. So, often you'll have data nested in uh, further levels. So, for example, you might have kids in classes in schools, yeah. and so each of those levels could contribute to their grades. So in this case, we would have classes nested in schools, and we use this type of uh, uh, dash. And this is how we write it in NLME. But sometimes you could have memberships which are not nested. So you, you have some, uh, some non-independence. So you're looking at vaccination records, let's say, that you're looking at that. Uh, and you have doctors, but doctors are not nested in schools. They're their own little level. There's no reason to assume that there's one doctor for every school or that doctors in some way are subservient to schools, but they could contribute to uh, the vaccination uh, uh, record, uh, and so could the school. So in this case, we have a random coefficient for a school and a random coefficient for doctors, but they're not nested. So you could also have this situation. Another example would be uh, perhaps uh, uh, teachers who teach at multiple schools. So you could have a teacher which isn't a perfect fit to a school because teachers could belong to multiple schools uh, if they are, for example, in fractionary uh, contracts. Yeah. So, and if you didn't want to separate, separate out the teacher effect from a school effect, this is how you write those models. Yeah. So just to give you an uh, idea, we can also plot some of these uh, effects. Like this is uh, the no model, the school effect. This is the random slope. This is, again, what we've seen. And what we can also then do is we can bootstrap all those effects. Yeah. So again, you could do different types of bootstraps. You could say we have to keep the structure. So if a school has for this, from this school, we sample over and over. Or we could uh, we sample based on, on cases. So here's an example where it's a case type of bootstrap. And you can read more if you go and read in this package LME resampler. And that will tell you how to bootstrap for it. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you how to install, like as we've installed in the, in the things before. So, fortunately, some packages have gone online since when I designed the lectures in, uh, in uh, August and now. So, that's very unlucky. But uh, you will be able to install a legacy package as we've done for the other thing. So, if you use that type of code that Alex showed you to install BDA, which is on the discussion board, you can also use that to install LME resampler. And if you still have problems, post it on the discussion board, and I'll point you how to install it. That's, uh, yeah, thanks for pointing out. So because I installed my packages during summer, <laughs> uh, I'm very unfortunate. And I think last time with BDA, it uh, went offline the week before or two weeks before. So I hope you cut me some slack with packages out, because I have no control over when uh, people's uh, codes get removed from the internet. So in this case, we set a seat, and we built a bootstrap model. We say which model it is. It's the school average model. Uh, we say that we're interested in the fixed effects. And we do uh, a certain type of uh, bootstrap. And then we say, you can change this as to where it can resample. Does it only have to resample from the lower level or also from the higher level? So you could change that to false-false or true-true, depending on whether you want to 
keep the completely nested structure or you don't care about the nested structure when doing the bootstrapping. And in this case, I'm taking, is it a thousand? A hundred. So I've taken a hundred because I don't want to wait too long when running my code. But ideally, you would take a large number because uh, it will be more stable. And so there will be some plateauing. So if you take 10,000 compared to a thousand, you won't gain that much more. But if you go from uh, 100 to 1,000, you'll gain quite a lot. And again, it's the central limit theorem all over again. And it's again uh, these type of convergence issues. And so this is then what you get. So this stores it as a data frame. So now we'll have 100 of those uh, samples. And then we can look at the results. So we can use scheme, which we looked at the, uh, 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 a bit before. And then it will print all those, uh, all those it's cool average and things. And we'll have the percentiles. We'll have the mean standard deviation and the percentiles of those things. So that's how we can bootstrap uh, uh, those fixed effects from our model. Yeah. And so if we don't want to find out the 95% confidence interval, we can just ask it to print us. So sometimes you will have missing bootstraps. In this case, I was lucky, but you'll probably have some. And then you will say na.omit, because you might get very unlucky. And for uh, one school, it will have sampled the same value 100 times. or like a, uh, So there's 100 students in the school. And you've been really unlucky. And in that school, they've taken the same value 100 times, which means there is no standard error, and there is no estimates, and it doesn't converge. So if that happens, then you'll have to use na.omit. So you will have, here we were quite lucky, all of them converge. So for every single of the bootstrap samples, we have all the data. But sometimes that will not happen. And this take, we say, from just look at school average and take the 25 percentile and the 97.5 uh, percentile. Because that gives us the 95 percent confidence interval. It's 2.5 percent one side, 2.5 percent the other side. And you can see that it doesn't overlap with zero, so we can conclude that there is a significant effect after bootstrapping for the uh, for the school average in that model. Yeah. How would you write this up? A case for sampling bootstrap procedure. So you can name the procedure. You can point to the package if you want to have uh, have uh, the uh, uh, have more information with 100 resamples. So you would say how many times you've done it. So it could be a thousand if you change that to a thousand shows that the effective school average was robust, and then that's that 95% confidence interval that we had before. And note sometimes that these bootstraps will not converge. And like I say, if you have, especially if you don't have large classes, for example, you could be unlucky that you draw the same value 20 times or something, especially if you run lots and lots of them. Just by chance, you're going to have some which don't converge. And then you report that as well. So you would say 100 samples from which 99 converged, and this is what the bootstrap is based on. So actually, I'm well in time to stand this thing. So you can continue working on your assignment uh, or uh, your, either the exercise or what you've done so far. So next week, we'll look closer at more common experimental designs and uh, how they could be multi-level models. So you might say, I'm not an occasional psychologist or a health psychologist. So I'll never work with uh, schools or uh, psychiatrists or hospitals. So this doesn't bother me. But you might still have an experiment. And then I'll uh, talk to you how you can recast experimental models into multi level models. And depending on time, we'll also come, uh, cover what will happen if you have common issues with these type of models. And we'll look at making some nicer graphs for, uh, for this. And that will be it. So for the exercise attached to this thing, we're going to build uh, uh, some models of, uh, from an experiment. And uh, so this, you can download the data from that link. Let's hope it still works. Hooray, it works. Uh, uh, so uh, you built a model like uh, like described here. You test that against a null model. So you're interested in uh, seeing if uh, pitch varies as a function of sex or gender uh, and the politeness in which people uh, speak. And you have to account for the fact that you've taken more than one sample from this, uh, this individual. So you have them speaking it several times. And then I would like you to say which one is the better one. I would like you to bootstrap this politeness effect, compare the model one to this model, which has one for item as well. So not a nested thing, but having two separate effects. And items are called scenarios in this, uh, uh, in this database. And then I would like you to make a model at random slopes for politeness for both subjects and items, and have a fixed effect as well. And compare this model with random slopes to the model with just random intercepts, but with the fixed effect and bootstrap that fixed effect. 
Okay, it seems like a lot, but if you work your way through it, it's all the things which I've covered on the slides. Any questions so far? And so these are lots of things I've been written about on multi-level uh, things, so but this is perhaps quite useful, and this is perhaps also quite useful because they're quite accessible, they're just hyperlinks. So I'm under no illusion that you're going to be probably quite confused by multi-level models, but this was just the first steps, and you're going to have to do some more reading if you want to find out more. Any burning questions? For now, about multi-level models. Okay. Uh, so I'll be here for another uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes or something together with Sarah. Sarah will stay on a little bit longer. Uh, if you don't, if you feel like you have other stuff to do, I don't want to keep you in the room. If you feel like uh, you've had enough art for today and uh, you want to wander off, so. And then last week, uh, next week is the last session, and then I'll also have some uh, in class. Well, just you tell me what you really hated. I already know that you hate R, but you can tell me uh, what you think was missing. So if there's something which uh, I, you feel I should have covered and I haven't covered, then I can take some notes about next time, next year. I realize it's very, very different from any class that you've had, but hopefully you've learned some things along the way as well. It's just once a new version of R line. So if you install R line, it just that error message is telling you you need a newer version of R line. So it's the same with those packages. So you then have to yeah, so you should be applied one call. Uh, they rolled out the new PCs, but then 
not use either your old software or packages. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, or so you think it works on them software? You could, uh, you could have a go, but I, yeah. I think <laughs> perhaps not. That it's sort of, I think what's happened is it's trying to sync two different things. So it's synced this for home directory, and then it's the home directory is synced the one before. And now they're on the server, and it doesn't know which one to use. So that's why you have duplicates for all these yeah. things, where there shouldn't be duplicates. <laughs> so I'll talk about it because it should be replacing uh, uh, computers at the middle of the middle term. It should be doing either at the start of term or at the end of the term to save us that. Thanks. This is the first time we've had this uh, type of issue in terms of uh, writing. What? <laughs> yes. Trust me, like it didn't happen, uh, it didn't happen last year. Just, they just like to test that one again. You yes. Yeah. But uh, what could take it that I do more than that? Like, um, she's done and can say it's not uh, uh, like I have issues with the writing and things in my directory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because unless they give me the right to the network, this is not something I can fix for you because it's, uh, it has to do with permissions to write. I'm sorry. I'll try, I'll, I'll try it on my computer. See try it on your computer. And, and if then, not, then, then, uh, then post a ticket. And... Uh, it says it's a mistake. Yeah. So I didn't know which one. So I'll change it just to this one. Okay. So I can have a bit of discuss this. Have you loaded it on your one? Yeah. 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 So you only have to So Probably didn't work between the 
can see on the date of my slides when I last run it. So that's when I know for sure it's worth the mining for you. Thank you. 
So I'm going to leave you here, unless there's a burning question, so I'll uh, post tickets if you have issues continuing to write on your uh, on your directory. I think it's unfortunate because I think they migrated some of the PCs and not the other ones, and that's causing the issue. But uh, try it also on your own machine if you can, uh, because there might be no issues there. And if you have any questions, post them on the discussion board, and I'll try and get back to you. I've posted something on the Blackboard, like I'll... I'll need a Christmas break as well, so I'll not continuously check every three days during the Christmas break, but I'll uh, try and do so intermittently. But you can't be guaranteed a 72-hour apply during the Christmas break. I hope that's okay.